Mayor, City Councilor. Today is Tuesday, May 9th. We are here as part of our annual budget review with the fine men and women from the Boston Fire Department regarding dockets 0536 through 0538. Orders for the fiscal year 18 operating budget, including annual appropriations for departmental operations, annual appropriation for the school department, and appropriation for other post-employment benefits. Dockets 0539 through 0543. <laughs> capital budget appropriations, including loan orders and lease and purchase agreements. I'd like to remind folks that this is a public hearing. Uh, it is both being broadcast on RCN channel 82 and Comcast channel 8 and recorded for later viewing. I'd ask people in the chamber to silence their electronic devices. At the conclusion of the presentation from the fire department and questions and answers from my colleagues, we will take public testimony. There are sign-in sheets to my left. We ask that you state your name, affiliation, and uh, residence. I'd like to uh, also acknowledge in the chamber, we have um, the president of local firefighters 718, Richie Paris and Bob, uh, vice president. Thanks for joining us. Uh, my colleagues, in order of their arrival, to my left, Councillor at large, Anissa Sabi George, uh, the chairman of public safety, Councillor Andrea Campbell, to my right, to my far left, Councillor at large, Michael Flaherty, District City Councillor Tim McCarthy, and to my right, Councillor Matt O'Malley. Uh, let me, for, before I hand it over to you, Chief, um, let me first say congratulations, uh, Fire Chief of the Year uh, from the Metropolitan Fire Chiefs Association, which is a, a U.S. and Canada organization. So you're international now. So I just want to <laughs> thank you for your service and for that well-deserved award. Um, it's all yours. <laughs> well, thanks, Mark. That first off, the award is uh, a culmination of everyone's hard work. I just happen to be in the position. Uh, I got to thank everybody who's part of the team and put that all together because it's certainly a team sport and uh, we're moving the department in the right direction. Great. So. Good to hear. Congratulations. Um, open remarks. Yeah. Um, Councilor, uh, Chairman, and uh, other members of the City Council. First, I'd like to thank Mayor Walsh for his continued support as we build the Boston Fire Department. I would also let I would also like to thank the Mayor's staff and Office of Budget Management for their diligence and insight as we prepared the FY18 budget. I would also thank my budget team, comprised of Deputy Commissioner of Administration of Finance Kathleen Judge, Senior Budget Analyst Bill Zah, and Analyst Vandana Toretti for the hard work they put into this year's budget process. I would also like to thank Chiefs of Operations Fontana and Walsh and Deputy Commissioner Connie Wong for the hard work they put in every day, day in and day out for this department. And I would also like to thank the City Council for the continued support of the Boston Fire Department and for holding this hearing in the FY18 Fire Department budget. FY18 is an important strategic year for us. Through your support in the mayor, we continue to invest in the purchase of new apparatus and commitment to renovating and rebuilding our firehouses. Last year, as part of the FY17 budget plan, we committed to reducing our overtime expenditures by 5%, and I'm pleased to say that we actually reduced that by 6.5%. For FY18, we remain committed to keeping our overtime flat. We will also be implementing a contractual change to add an EMT differential. As a result, we will reduce the overtime that was previously paid as training time for EMT course, represent another 3.6% <coughs> reduction. Also, as part of the salary budget, representing the entire increase in the FY18 budget over FY17, is a transfer of salaries for the 75 firefighters from the safer grants onto the general fund budget. If you recall, this grant originally saved the city almost $13 million. This past February, we applied for an additional safer grant, funding again for 65 firefighters, but we'll not know until the end of the summer if that's been approved. If approved, it'll bring the city approximately another $12 million in savings. We're also installing Kronos and Telestaff software, software to implement a scheduling system schedule and strengthen the accountability on all four working groups in the field. We had hoped to get this started in FY17, but due to a change to bring in a project management in-house and to do it, 
we have now officially kicked off the project to begin project planning this summer. We have continued to make progress in the mission to find ways to improve the overall health and wellness of the members, which is focused on three major areas. One, cancer awareness and reduction. Two, cardiac fitness and overall well-being. And three, the reduction of the musculoskeletal injuries. We continue to share awareness and structural videos in the fire service with the fire, other fire departments around care and cleaning of firefighters after atten, um, working at and operating at structural fires. With the help of the Gary Sinise Foundation for $388,000, we were able to install the remaining industrial dryers in the firehouses uh, that were missing them um, through the efforts of the Last Call <laughs> Foundation, along with uh, being able to bring in drying cabinets into every firehouse into the city. With the help of the Last Call Foundation uh, for $133,000, we'll be able to install a long overdue HVAC, HVAC system in Engine 33 and Ladder 15, which will also have additional benefits in the amount of mold that accumulates in the walls due to the humidity. We have trained over 350 firefighters, including 63 new recruits, including 14 from other cities and towns in the O2X fitness philosophy. And our new functional skills test has, we have trained a number of Boston firefighters in a time-driven skill evaluation in the academy to make them improve their firefighting skills. Last year, you approved and funded for the conversion of 45-minute air bottles, and we have completed our conversion without interruption. And this has made a terrific difference in the fire ground. To improve the overall living conditions, we are reviewing several proposals in the scope to work at the, to industrial clean four, three to four of our firehouses, a pilot program to help reduce and clean the environments in which firefighters are working. As part of the FY18 budget, we received $500,000 for this pilot program. We continue to sustain our training hours at around 28,000, up from approximately 8,000 back in FY13. We were fortunate to receive an additional 500000 this year from the state training grant for a total of $2.25 million. We have requested an AFG grant for a wind and heat simulator to be added to our training academy next year and additional driver training hours given the insurgence of new apparatus. I am also especially proud to share with you the accomplishments of three committees we established and the work they completed. First was the Fire Apparatus Committee. The committee continued their due diligence and specifications of new fire engines. This was particularly important since we have entered into a three-year contract to purchase 23 new engines. The committee carefully specified every detail that we required for the engines, down to the specifics on the pump panel, the fabric of the seats to mitigate the accumulation of carcinogens and toxins, to the specific design of the front suction and the hose compartments, all of which achieved much smaller, less compacted, firefighter easy to use, street friendly, tight turning radius, and firehouse friendly fire, fire engines for the city of Boston. The engine will accommodate both water and foam and the result is less expensive. The committee also achieved similar excellence in the specifications of 18 new aerial ladders. We have already received nine and we have just been awarded a three year contract for the next nine. And the first three to be delivered in November of this year. As a result of the committee's efforts, we have saved the city an average of $1.3 million on the engines. Prior administration purchase engines cost $505,000. We were able to reduce the cost of these engines down to $450,000. And over $2.4 million on the aerials. The prior aerials were cost around $910,000. We were able to get the cost down to $960,000. Uh, since the prior administration purchased the engines and aerials, and the new trucks, both the aerials and the engines, uh, are, are made for Boston's neighborhoods. They're smaller, compact, easy to use, I should say, tighter turning radius to deal with the tight streets that we deal with in some of our more congested neighborhoods. And from uh, the viewpoint of the firefighters who are actually hands-on every day with them, they love them. Okay, we just received the first engine uh, of, the, uh, of the 23, and it has already received rave reviews on its ability and what it can do on the fire ground. A lot of trucks speak for themselves. They're, they're um, E1 trucks. Uh, the ladder trucks have a, a low slung jacking system, single axle. They get into our tight neighborhoods and actually function properly compared to what was being purchased in the past. 
and I'm really proud of what the work the, the apparatus committee did on doing that, getting the appropriate sized equipment, and also reducing the cost, the overall cost for the city, which is tremendous. Um, the second was the future firehouse committee. Um, for those who don't know, the average age of Boston firehouses is 76 years old. Uh, we're very old and tired. Uh, the firehouses have significant issues, and uh, we've been working diligently with um, property management, construction management, and also with OBM uh, on the best way to achieve this. Um, we have hired two, two architectural firms have been hired by the city's property and structure management division, steered our committee to start work on the design of engine 42 in the Eagleson Square section of the city. And um, we're very pleased with the way the progress is going on the design of these firehouses. I'll talk a little more about that if you have any specific questions, but um, as you can imagine, the firehouses in their tire shape uh, have been neglected throughout the years. And, you know, when you look at their, if you will, ability to perform the functions of a modern fire department, they're very limited, the common firehouses in the situation. Um, the committee did a great job inspecting these firehouses out, and I, I have to commend them for that. The third, we have a technology committee, and I have to mention here that um, I gotta give kudos to um, Chief uh, Yasha Franklin Hodge from Dewey. I'll tell you, his people have been nothing but supportive of every endeavor we've brought to them uh, regarding data and how best to use the data and how best to design programs for the Boston Fire Department. And I'll tell you, it has made a significant difference in a performance management-based system that we're working under now. And uh, I, I felt compelled to make sure I recognize do it for, for their hard work and what they've done for us. Um, you know, this work included planning to avoid obsolescence and mitigating issues in, in fire apparatus and firehouses. The committee will serve to ensure the right technology, such as wireless, is incorporated into the future firehouses, but also ensure the copper cabling from all our boxes is sustained. Despite its age, copper cabling will continue to be essential backup should we have a terrorism event or blackout across the city where the cell towers and electricity are out and call boxes still work. Um, I'm also pleased to announce we promoted uh, and moved uh, into a public fire education officer. We talked about that last year at this council hearing. Uh, it certainly was a uh, if you will, a blind spot for the department, considering uh, the school age and the elderly in the city, uh, and we've been able to, we funded a position and have a full-time public education officer, and we're gonna be looking to expand that role uh, as we try to educate some of the youth in the city, but more importantly, the elderly. The elderly are where we're starting to see some significant vulnerabilities, and we need to be in that community to make sure that they're being educated in proper fire safety and things. Um, we also um, have hired a diversity officer, Juan Sanchez, over a year ago, and he's been working hard at what he's been doing. Um, he's, he's established uh, through collaboration, the ABCD High School Teen Academy Summer Program, uh, Madison Park, he's been working with an English high school's all fired up program that we have there. Uh, Summer Explorers, we're gonna be bringing in to work in the fire headquarters on, uh, through the PIC program, and the BFD Credit Union is gonna fund some positions. Uh, high, high school ROTC boot camp and outreach through ball. We have a number of firefighters who are, um, run a basketball program and they want to get involved heavily in the community and we're starting that on the ground level right now and Juan's been spearheading that for us, uh, which I think will be you know, a great tool for us to be the exposed young children to service in the fire department and, and also the benefits that come with that. Um, and he's also been out in the veteran community. Uh, we're working with Soldiers for Life, uh, which is an Army program, but all branches of the military have uh, a for life program, whether it's a Marine for Life, a Navy for Life, or uh, Coast Guardsmen for Life, uh, which is basically, they allow servicemen to actually discharge almost six months earlier than their scheduled dates, and if they can find an intern, and they'll be paid to um, their, their respective branches of the service. So we're working with them to expose them to um, the benefits of coming to a firefighter in the city of Boston. Uh, we also have the USO Mentor Program and Veterans Service Office Partnership. We're working bi-monthly. Juan is out in the community uh, promoting the Boston Fire Department and the minority communities, uh, hoping to help us in our diversity. Um, we have a class of 60 in this budget be coming on and our plan will be uh, on the diversity side is that we're going to use a power aid program 
to go after language specific um, hires of that 60, I'd like to see 15 to 20. Uh, and we've scanned the list and done the research where I think we see, uh, without having to migrate outside of the veterans of that on those lists, that we could actually obtain some minority hires in that group. And I think that'd be a very beneficial to the department as we move in the diversity scope that we're trying to move. So those are my open remarks, Council. Great. Thank you, Commissioner. We've since been joined by Councilor at Large Ayanna Presley and District City Councilor Josh Zakum. Um, Richie, did you want to say a few words now? You, you can. Yeah, sure. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, Councilors, uh, Commissioner, and his team. Uh, it's it's a different era now. Before we were. We were disagreeing. We never had any union in, you know, participation. And I want to thank the commissioner and uh, Chief Montana, Chief Walsh, and, and his team up at headquarters, Andrea at HR. Uh, with, they're doing a great job. They're getting the union involved uh, with the committees, and, and uh, it's, it's, it's a great job. We're moving in the right direction. We, um, I want to thank the mayor and the city councilors for also helping us out with the, the fire trucks. We've got 23 new engines and 18 new ladder trucks, and they're all the same. Before they were different trucks. Guys were working on on different engine companies and different trucks, and it was um, it, it wasn't done right. And the committees were put together, and as the union and management worked together, we were uh, we're making it safer for the firefighters and for the citizens of the city of Boston, which is our number one goal: is the safety of the citizens. Um, you know, the the training uh, we're we're teaming up with the IFF, bringing trainers in to help them with um, terrorist training to our first responders and to all of, uh, the firefighters. Uh, which is, is great with the commission that just started when he became in. And um, the new firehouses are very important. That's very important in this budget because um, it's, and it's not funny, but it's the first time a firehouse has been built from the city in nine, since 1982 on Center Street, Tower 10, in Engine 28. And the firehouse that the vice president and I belong is Engine 42 Squatters. That was built for a, a fire engine and a chief's car. It now has a fire engine, a chief car, and a heavy-duty rescue coming out of there. And the floor's falling apart. The house is falling apart. And, you know, this, this new house that we're, we're looking at to be built, it's, it's going to bring us into the future for uh, special operations, you know, uh, for the training. So the money for these new firehouses in the budget is very, very important. Engine 17 up in Meeting House Hill, that place is falling apart. A lot of them are falling apart. But... I just want to stress that the money in these new firehouses and having them cleaned and, and refurbished is, is very important to the members so that they can uh, be taken care of while they're, while they're working. And, and I know the city council is and the mayor is on board along with the commissioner. So that, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. I appreciate the time. And, and uh, I want to thank the commissioner again and his team. Thank you. Thanks, Richie. Um, <laughs> Speaking of the equipment, uh, that, that's a large purchase and uh, a needed one. I remember, I think, when I came on almost 10 years ago, the average age was 15 to 17 years for apparatus. So have we made a, a significant um, dent in that average age? Oh, significant. And, you know, Councilor, it's um, – where do you begin? Um, first off, the equipment that was bought was substandard. Okay, we're in active litigation uh, with uh, KME, which was the manufacturer of 11 of our engines and three of our current ladder trucks. Mm -hmm. uh, we're getting close to finalizing uh, a settlement on that. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the, the equipment was bought. First off, it wasn't conducive to the neighborhoods in the city of Boston. They bought equipment that didn't fit into firehouses. Uh, they bought substandard to the point where the... Uh, engines would just shut down, and, and it just goes to the whole, uh, the, the engines, they picked the wrong engines is what they did. Mm. But um, we're getting close to that. But so I would tell you this, Council, within 18 months, I will tell you that probably 90% of the entire fleet will have been replaced. It'll be under wow. probably three to four years. Well, that, that's, that's really a significant, I mean, it's taken almost 10 years, but we were kind of digging out of a hole for a long time. So, and, and I believe, to your point, having the same engines, I, I mean, just the consistency, right. you know, if a firefighter transfers from one to another, he's going to be driving possibly the same kind of vehicle rather than trying to learn a new vehicle, just common sense stuff. So 
It's great. That was the concept. It was to make right. sure everything was uniform um, right. going forward. So like pump operations are a little more difficult than ladder aerial mm -hmm. operations. I mean, you got no water pressures and things like that. So everything's standardized. These pumps are all common standard, mm -hmm. the same. And when we go further into our replacement process, that'll be part of the spec. So anyone who doesn't want to bid on it, mm -hmm. it's going to be the Boston pump panel. So if you can't design it, you won't be bidding. Right. So right. that's the way we plan on moving forward on that. Right. And, and I'm sure that presented a lot of problems with maintenance, too, with all different kinds of vehicles. Has that improved the whole maintenance? Because we had issues with, uh, you know, maintaining the, uh, the fleet as it was. It's certainly taken pressure off, Council. I, I can tell you this is, um, you know, in fact, you go back to 2015 during that horrendous winter. I, I had many sleepless nights over it. I mean, we had areas of the city that were not protected, mm -hmm. not from snow. It's just that we didn't have apparatus in those neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And then you put the snow and, and the inability to get around. It was a very, uh, you know, a very dangerous period in the city. And now we're, we're far removed from that. And through Mayor Walsh's and the initiative and help from the council, we're far removed from that. And, right. uh, you know, we're able to uh, function and perform our duties effect effectively and efficiently. Right. And uh, I'm very comfortable with the way the department's moving. Right. And, and, and the great... Um strides in the washing machines to get rid of the carcinogens so are we in every so every firefighter now has access or are we close well i tell you every firefighter has access not every firehouse has one okay so uh the last call foundation uh passed that ball to the gary sinise foundation and mm -hmm. gary sinise foundation i mean for those who don't know gary sinise is lieutenant dan yeah. And uh, Forrest Gump. Forrest and, Gump. And, uh, stupid is as stupid yeah. does. <laughs> very generous organization. Very, very generous foundation. Uh, they, they came across with uh, $388,000 for us to finish the uh, outfitting the remaining 10 houses and the drying cabinets. The drying cabinets are crucial to the time that we can turn the gear back into service. Mm -hmm. um, I was more interested initially is to get the washers in place so people who had clean gear and hopefully, you know, the gear was basically drip drying. It mm -hmm. took a long time, as you can imagine. The drying cabinets are crucial. So by, I would think, in the next uh, 12 months or so, every firehouse should be equipped, 12 to 18 months, every firehouse will be equipped with the industrial washer and extractor and the drying cabinet. So I think we'll see some uh, great results from that. That's great. Uh, and just to switch to the safer grant, obviously, you know, the increase in the operation budget is significant um, because of that. Um, is that, was that a cut in the overall funds or just the cut of the safer grant as a, as a funding source? Well, the, it, it was cut of the safer grant as a funding source. So safer funded us for the two years to the savings of like $12 million. So we basically got two years of free salaries and then we mm -hmm. moved and mm -hmm. then it was time to put, take them off the safer, the external funding and move them onto the operating. Right. And it looks like, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, the training uh, budget line is up a little over 14%, and then the maintenance is up almost 17%. It seems like that's where um, a lot of the um, extra funds went. Well, uh, the training council, the majority, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that 80 to 90% of our training comes off the state training grant. Mm -hmm. uh, and we were fortunate enough with that increase. Uh, FY16, we were at $1.75 mm -hmm. And we received a $500,000 increase. So I think that's where you're going to see the uptick, because we did increase training around the additional funds we received, that additional $500,000 in training. Right. Uh, maintenance is just, as I mentioned, is just an ongoing issue with us. With the, the, mm -hmm. uh, first, with the, the condition of the apparatus, so we're still trying to maintain until we get we take until we onboard all those other pieces of equipment, and then also the issues around firehouse upkeep and trying to do the repairs to the firehouse. Right, right. Um, all right, let me recognize Councillor Campbell. <laughs> I always feel like this is so far away. <laughs> thank you, Councillor Siamo. Um, and thank you, Commissioner, and your team, and Richie and Bob, and your team um, for all that you guys do, not only for the fire department, obviously, but for the city of Boston. Um, you don't just put out fires. Like I told the commissioner, I was uh, happy to see a few, few of your guys at a community meeting addressing residents about some major concerns they had about some properties that are vacant and have been for a long time after a fire where the 
where the owner hasn't done what they are supposed to do to really get that property, frankly, back online and looking good in the neighborhood. So your firefighters are there answering questions and residents appreciate that. So thank, thank you. you. I just have questions specifically about some of the line items. Yeah. So this is page 167 in the budget book, which I think you guys have, you should have a copy of this. So just looking at some of the decreases, um, specifically, not the overtime, which is great, actually, when it comes to the overtime, because the overtime restrictions, obviously, are cost-saving measures. We also attach to the police department as well. Um, and you guys not only realize that, you went above and beyond that 5% initially. So that's, that's fantastic. But specifically looking at garbage and waste removal, repair buildings and structures, there's sort of a large decline there. Can you maybe walk us through as to what that's about? May I? Sure. So Thank you, Kathleen. Yeah. So, Andrea, the, um, in the uh, garbage and waste removal area, last year in FY17, we had a one-time expense to remove some asbestos in some of the firehouses. We completed that project, so we didn't need the funding again in FY18. And then in the repairs for buildings and repairs and service to equipment, there's just a switch between those two categories. We had some equipment repairs for radios in the repairs for buildings, so it was in the wrong category. So we had to move it to the repairs for equipment. That makes sense. And then lastly, the auto energy supplies. Yes, in the auto line, the, that category has all of our fuel expense. So we've seen a, a decline in the rate for fuel. So I think if you um, have also seen that outside, mm -hmm. just as you drive on your, on your own, the cost for fuel has dropped the rate. So we also have that benefit. So right now, going back to the garbage and waste removal, none of the houses have asbestos in, it, in them. <laughs> There's, there is still some in okay. like places like 42, but because we are expecting to now um, raise that building yep. and rebuild, we don't think we should make that investment to take it out because it's going to come out when we do the demolition. Perfect. And, and moving um, into the area of the firehouses, how many total firehouses do we have in the city? 34. 34. Um, and right now... So I'm assuming the committee that was working on this developed a list, um, maybe in a priority or, in, or, or in a sense of order in terms of which house should be completed first, second, third, fourth. Or do all 30, well, obviously not all 34, but how many actually need substantive repair? All. All of them. <laughs> and right now, Eggleston is slated to go through some design work and to have something done there. That's correct. Um, and then all other 33 still need something done? So uh, we're actually working, um, those are two total replacements, would be Engine 42, Eggleston, and Engine 17, Meat and House Hill. Those are two total replacements. Those are knockdowns. We do have some other major renovations going on. We have um, Engine 50 in Charlestown, uh, which is going to go through a $4 million renovation. We're going to be relocating Engine 50 down the street to where Engine 32 is for about a year. And we're going to be renovating that to two. How much? Almost $4 million, like 3.8 something. Uh, and then Engine 33 and Ladder 15 on uh, Boylston Street is going to go through a multi-million dollar, uh, if you will, renovation also. And of the other firehouses that need support, um, is there a list that even the council could see as to the order in which those sort of need to be repaired? Council, we, we, we're trying to compile that. We okay. actually have a... Um, an old assessment of the properties that we're kind of working off of, and we're going to be trying okay. to work on a future assessment of it. And uh, there's a number of the houses have different reasons. And as you can imagine, as time progresses, one could almost leapfrog the other if something goes wrong, you know, if something happens with the firehouse. So we're trying to and put a five-year plan together with the mayor on uh, a replacement or uh, plan. It's five five-year plan. Five -year plan or moving to the moving in some kind of form and fashion, how we're going to move that down the road, which is going to take a significant amount of time. But that's, that's good to know. I mean, one of the frustrations of mine, particularly if we're looking at 
any of the public safety agencies is whether or not there's a concrete plan, a tangible plan attached to reaching the goal, which is frankly to make sure that all these firehouses are brought up to to modern day, you know, sort of code and function. Um, what do you think this would cost? The assessment? To, uh, to uh, redo the assessment? all the firehouses. <laughs> you know, I think what's problematic right now is the fact that uh, the cost of construction in the city of Boston is so high. You know what I'm saying? I, mm -hmm. I think that's part of it. I think there's so much development going on in the city that it's the supply and demand effect. I think it's driving cost, to be honest with you. And I think that's, uh, I'd be going way out on a limb, and I, I kind of not comfortable doing that on what like a total replacement plan okay. would be. Um, but the five-year plan would be, is the five-year plan at least the ultimate goal to come out of that and say, in five years, all, by that point, maybe 33 of these houses will be um, upgraded, rehabilitated, renovated, or is it to do an assessment over that time? It's to do an assessment and, and, okay. then, and then to, I would say, stagger it out. I mean, because this, this, the, the level of neglect over 33 years is not going to be corrected in a mm -hmm. day or five years. Mm -hmm. It's going to take substantive time, you know, where resources become available. It, we're, we're thinking, um, which we've had probably the last firehouse that was actually the last two firehouses that were funded, if you will, were funded by outside resources, were 3P projects. I mean, that's, that's something we need to look at, private-public partnerships around that. Um, firehouse, I think everyone's familiar with, is the International Place. We have a firehouse in International Place. It was basically um, back in 1985 or 86. 86? 87. 87. All right. Uh, it was... Um, it was part of the whole international place complex, and, and that we had the firehouse on Oliver Street. It was basically a swap, and it was a build the firehouse underneath international. Um, and then the other one was the marine unit, which is down on Battery Wharf, which they wanted to build a condo complex down there. We had the property. They put a, um, a condo in for the, for the marine unit down on uh, Battery Wharf. So we sit on some very valuable real estate. In the city, I mean, if you look around, we sit on some very valuable real estate, and I think we should leverage it. Right. I think I think there's, there's I think opportunity and time is here. Uh, the need is here for sure, but I think we need to start thinking around that leveraging and, and seeing what we can uh, do. And you know, even an RFI just on request for information, see see what we need to do around it, and see if there's uh, an idea of, of trying to help us get through the cost. You know. And then my last question for I turn it over to my other colleagues, I can always come back around. It's just obviously having to do with diversity. I, I do want to applaud the efforts of Juan and, and, and what, first of all, hiring him, bring him on. Um, and I've met with him. He is excited about the work and already doing some innovative things. I know we've talked in passing about the cadet program and, and we'll have a hearing probably sometime in the fall to talk about feasibility. But I will say what's come out of uh, following that hearing order with Councillor Linehan has been some productive conversations, um, not only with folks in community who care about the issues, specifically of diversity, taking even outside the, taking the residency piece out of it, but just diversity in terms of seeing more women, more people of color serving in our fire department. Um, but productive conversations have also come about with veterans um, who have their concerns, not only with uh, fire and, and police, and every department is different, but who also, I think, have some solutions um, and ways in which to think about how we increase diversity. So it's a, dial it's a, a dialogue that's beginning. Um, I frankly think a dialogue that needs to happen. Um, and I look forward to continuing the conversations with you, your team, um, on how we not create the us versus them, but really come together to think about how we increase diversity in the department um, so it's reflective of, of those who live in the city of Boston, but mainly an opportunity um, for those who look like me, um, to serve in such an incredible department. So I, I want to thank you for your uh, conversations that you've had on, uh, with me about this. Um, and I want to thank publicly um, Juan and his work because he's committed and it's, it's really great to see. So thank you for giving well, him to ro the room to try different things and to be creative. Well, Council, we're committed to it. We, we understand the issue. We're committed to it. And, there's, there's, and we just got to figure the best way to, to achieve that goal. And um, I, I, you know, we're going to make those strides and that effort. We're going to commit resources and everything to that topic. And hopefully we'll see the results.
I think I mentioned it in my opening remarks, we're going to look at a par rate off this next list. Uh, you know, we're going to commit, set aside 15, 20 positions, depending on where we're at, and not create, if you will, that friction between the veterans groups, mm -hmm. because we have that number of um, language. It, it's funny when, you know, I, I'm, state law comes into play for me. Okay. I have to send a request. I mean, just on the language piece, I'll just say this. I have to uh, send a request, and they look for specific incidents where language was a barrier. I don't think I need to do that. I would think the fact that I have language in specific neighborhoods of this city that that's a primary language mm -hmm. should be justification enough. I shouldn't have to scour and look for a specific incident where there was a negative impact. I think the fact that we got a heavy Haitian population in Mattapan and, and Dorchester. We have different areas, uh, Cape Verde, all up in up in Skwana, and, and certainly um, the need for in the Latino neighborhoods. I shouldn't have to find an incident where it was a hindrance or it was an impediment. I think the fact that we have them neighborhoods, that that primary language is, is not English, that we should be able to do that. So we're going to have some dialogue with HID over this because I, I haven't no, made sense. No, and I, I agree with you. It's, it's, it's really unfortunate that you or Commissioner Evans and others have to prove um, to the state that um, language diversity is essential and that you right. have to prove that we need that category in the city of Boston. Um, I think the BPD applied was rejected and has to go back. Um, so I, I agree with you. They make it more difficult and more challenging. So anything that we can do on the council side, um, let us know. And I applaud you. For, for those efforts um, as well. Um, and I really want to say, even the legal piece, it is more complicated with the fire department than it is the police department. We often lump all the public safety agencies together. Right. Each one is different, has a history all their own. Um, but I appreciate uh, the partnership and I appreciate the dialogue. Um, and I just wanted you guys to know that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And thank, uh, you. thank you, Councillor. Uh, we've been joined by District City Councillor Tito Jackson. Uh, Councillor Sabi Joy. Thank you, Chair, and thank you all for being with us today. I do, I just want to echo with what Councillor Campbell was saying about creating or developing an official master facilities plan, similar to what we are doing and <laughs> maybe have done, or hopefully to hear more about the master facilities plan for BPS. Um, and just imagine over, you know, with considering all the firehouses, and if it's a million of, a, a minimum of five million per firehouse, that's an incredible investment that we need to make as a city but one that we've got to, um, I think, really get ahead of at this point because we are so far behind. And, and I've shared with you and um, I know with, with Richie and his folks over at the union that um, I think 25 years ago, um, we had a significant fire in my home. And it was, I think, mostly due to the efforts of the firefighters, but partly to the proximity, the proximity from the firehouse to, to my house um, that we, you guys were able to, contain the fire just to my house. And, you know, I'm on a tight corner with lots of triple deckers. Um, so that was an incredible, I think, feat for all of you. And I continue to this day to applaud the work of Boston Fire. Uh, but I am concerned about, as the city grows, about gaps in services uh, because we haven't added firehouses. Um, so can you talk a little bit about where some of the gaps are across the city and where we need to invest, whether it's in um, additional apparatus or perhaps a new firehouse as the city city grows um it it, it back to the do it group they've been fabulous with us with using uh the cad numbers and our response stuff to 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 basically give us a good picture of what's going on around uh neighborhoods in the city and where our response time is lagging i would tell you this is um right off the top of my head i would say the seaport area which is um and when i say that i say that because uh, their, pro their primary response is coming out of international place, if you will, the firehouse on uh, uh, right there, located across from the Intercontinental Hotel. And anyone who's tra <laughs> traveled downtown knows what traffic is like. We see their response times are not meeting the national standards because the time it takes them to get out of the firehouse, to get through the traffic, and to get down to the seaport is well over the national average. Uh, and then the problem comes when they're trying to come back. And rush hour doesn't seem to be rush hour no more. Rush hour, as far as uh, the downtown traffic volume, uh, doesn't seem to be uh, basically defined between like four and six no longer. Uh, 
uh, 7 and 9 in the morning. Uh, rush hour goes all day almost, especially at that house. I mean, they, they, they're, they're encumbered probably from 2 o'clock in the afternoon on until about 8 o'clock at night, 7, 8 o'clock at night, uh, and getting in and getting out of that, that house. Uh, that's one area, and, that, and that's the primary response down to the seaport, and we're seeing it. I guess if there's a blessing in disguise with that, you would say that uh, those buildings down there that are being built are all class one fire resistant buildings. They get sprinkler systems and thing on. Uh, but think about the uh, the medical issues. Think about a sudden cardiac arrest. I mean, there's a lot of restaurants, things like that down there. That that, that primary response is crucial in, in survivability of uh, someone who's having a significant medical event down in that area. So it that's a problem area. I, I would say that is somewhere we need to be looking, especially as development continues down around the waterfront. I mean, I think the numbers, uh, I don't know how many thousands of new residents are going to be down there in the next five, ten years. I mean, it's certainly an area. Um, the past administration took out uh, a chief out in West Roxbury, um, which we see some, we see a, a, a bit of a lag time uh, with response out into the West Roxbury section of the city. Um, the, the second new ladder truck, from a fire perspective, comes out of um, uh, Rosendale comes out of American Legion Highway, and you think about the travel they have to do if they're going to try to make to the end of like Grove Street out off Washington, the end of Washington. It's a significant travel time, uh, and so there, there, are, there are areas there. Uh, I guess you could go with the fact that uh, the fire volume or events are not that significant in that neighborhood. But uh, also, I go back to my initial what I was just mentioning about that emergency medical response and the other functions that we perform as a department and the delay and what that delay can mean. So those would be my two areas, I think, where uh, we need to be cognizant and keep an eye on and, and try to follow that response times and see if there's an issue. Well, I'd also consider as surrounding um, cities and towns to Boston grow, there, the pressure it puts on us as we do, I forget what it's called. Mutual aid. When we have the mutual aid, that that puts pressure on us as well as those cities and towns grow. And then I think of East Boston and the reliance of um, the, or the airport's reliance on us to assist them both on, I guess, especially on medical calls, because I know yep. it puts a strain on EMS. Yep. It must also put a strain on Boston Fire at the right. same time. Um, speaking of medical responses, could you talk a little bit about the department's use of Narcan, sure. how many doses maybe have been delivered yep. over the last year, and how we can do a better job supporting that work? Um, I wish I could tell you this was trending the other way, but it's not. Um, we had um, 629 doses administered last year, last fiscal year. And the way I view that, that's 629 lives saved. That's how I view this. You know what I mean? And that's, that's significant. That's more lives than the fire department would ever save in the last 50 years. That's a significant number of lives saved. Uh, because of us being able to get there and quickly, the time, timely, and be able to administer Narcan. This current year, we're up, we're going to exceed 800. We're up, we're 33% higher now than we were last year at this time. And uh, we certainly have problem neighborhoods, if you will, uh, I should say more frequent neighborhoods uh, around this issue. And uh, we have companies that are doing, uh, administering two or three doses a day. And, and, multiple, if you will, events with the same individual. So uh, it, I wish I was, there was a, a picture to paint that, that this was getting better, but it's not, and uh, we're starting to see that volume. I mean, 33% 30, increase is significant in my eyes. That's incredibly significant. Right. And it's also um, from, from the life-saving piece, which is so important to recognize, but we're also financially sending a truck out right. every time where get, you're getting one of those calls. And I, I understand that a number of you are firefighters, if not all of your fire, firefighters are EMTs as well? Um, I, I would say of the 1,500, I'd say 1,200. So okay. we're close. And, and there, there have previously been restrictions on what type of um, aid a firefighter could give an individual. Have, I know that Narcan is fairly new, that firefighters have been able to administer Narcan. Actually, Mayor Walsh was one of the first initiatives he did when he be took, became mayor. I think it was probably about after we went through the training piece. I think it was he made the decision, and about a, two weeks, two months afterwards, after the training and everything that was taking place, uh, we were able to uh, outfit every every company in the city with Narcan, and it's seen immediate impact. It, on that. it was silly that 
that he that I couldn't agree with you more. weren't allowed yeah. to administer that. Um, and then can you talk about just the purchasing of the Narcan? Are we partic participating in bulk purchasing? Because most of our city, I mean, I think lot, some of our larger city departments now have Narcan. School nurses have access to Narcan. Are we bulk purchasing that, or are you I, buying it on your own? We, yeah, we are buying it. And actually, we, we, we do come through the Public Health Commission, right? We, we, we do have it on contract now through purchasing, so it's bought for the city for all the departments. Great, because I think that just certainly yeah. drives down the cost of that. And then um, related, um, Sharp's disposal, we had a hearing a few weeks ago, Councilor McCarthy, myself, and Councilor Baker, on um, the number of improperly disposed Sharps across the city. The number's 20,000. I think it's an incredible number. Um, and I'm sure that your firefighters are responding to calls, whether it's for an Arcan um, or for anything else, and encountering improperly disposed of sharps. Can you talk a little bit about that process or the disposal that your men and women are going through? Well, if, if we come upon that situation, especially on one of the medical calls, if there's a uh, if it's an opiate call and there's a needle invisible and all that stuff, we'll you know usually we will do is we'll turn it over to EMS when they arrive. Uh, we'll you know isolate it, contain mm -hmm. it, and turn it over to EMS. Uh, and but if we don't, if we don't have the availability of EMS, we'll bring it back and have it disposed of at the firehouse. And we have a process we do that. Uh, do you have sharps boxes at all your fire, fire yes, firehouses? Yes, we do. We do. Great. And uh, those interior or exterior? Interior. Interior. Those are for your, your yes. folks too. Great. Thank you, uh, Ms. Ram. Thank you, Councilor Flaherty. And thank you. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, good to see you, uh, Commissioner, and your team. Um, don't consider myself a sparky, uh, but uh, know that I grew up, my grandmother always had a scanner on, my father has a scanner on, largely driven because of the number of family and friends, Uncle Mucker, or Uncle Todd, a uh, boatload of cousins. So uh, so they're always sort of listening. And, and at times of when there's been significant um, situation going on, I'll hear you at a command and um, just want to compliment on sort of the new protocols and management tools that are there where you're swapping out um, uh, companies and, and ladder companies and engine companies based on the amount of time that they've been exposed to the fire scene in the toxins uh, as well as the other elements. And so hopefully that's leading to a decrease uh, in injuries and on the job hazards. And um, so you talk about it, but when you're actually listening to it taking place, it's pretty refreshing to, to hear that uh, we have protocols in place. You are paying attention to them. Your team uh, uh, and your command staff are paying attention to them and, and arguably that they're, they're saving uh, you know, the men and women that work for, for our fire department, uh, uh, possibly from death, possibly from injury, and also exposure from toxins. So I just wanted to compliment uh, you on, on those efforts um, because I've heard them firsthand uh, listening to the to the squat box and to the scanners. I uh, want to put an oar in the water for um, a um, firehouse down at the South Boston waterfront, um, just given the volumes of projects that are happening, sure. down, particularly in the Ray Flynn Marine Industrial Park, which is probably the most appropriate location um, given the expansion down at the park, given a recent, uh, I believe it was an explosion at an old antiquated seafood factory. Right. Uh, there's a lot of old antiquated facilities down there that have the, uh, what's it, ammonia? Ammonia. And things like that. So they're still there, uh, coupled with uh, several new hotels coming online, expansion of the convention center. So uh, it takes a little pressure off of both Purchase Street and uh, both K and D Street. So. And then you're talking about a growth corridor that's envisioned for both uh, between Broadway and Andrew. Uh, talk about trying to get up Dodd Ave at any hour of the day. It's bumper to bumper. So uh, I'd be curious to see sort of response times for incidents down along the waterfront, uh, as well as uh, just along sort of Old Colony and Dodd Ave, uh, either from Engine 21 coming in or from, um, from the D Street uh, house going out. Um, so just a little editorial on that. And also just would like to hear some of the good news. I mean, we have the 23 new engines, sort of where are they across the city? And also those firehouses that are getting um, uh, renovation, uh, which neighborhoods uh, will be will be seeing those in their communities? So uh, every neighborhood is going to get a new fire engine. Uh, we, we, the new engines will be on board uh, in the next couple of months. And the plan is to, uh, through DOT, uh, we, they funded a couple engines for us through the years because of the tunnels the foam capabilities that we have and, and the concerns we have in the tunnels with uh, a, hazmat, a hazmat incident in the tunnel and, and, you know, certainly the lack of egress and ingress into the tunnel and things. So, so we had, they funded five engines for us that were purchased uh, under the old administration, the KME engines that were problematic. They were, mm -hmm. They're the group that are problematic. We have five of them. 
So the first five that are going to be replaced will be Engine 2 on K Street, um, Engine 3, which is down in the south, south end, end. Yep. Engine 4, which is down on Cambridge Street, yep. Engine 5 in East Boston, and Engine 41 in Brighton. They'll be the first ones because we're going to pull them out of, offline for a number of reasons. What we've done with these um, councils, I'll just go back to one of your comments about uh, some of the new protocols and what we've done. These 23 engines are coming with foam capability. Coming with what? Foam capability. Foam capable. So they're going to have, which is, is not a new concept, but it's new to the city of Boston. But we are going to have, each one of these new engines is going to have a 30-gallon foam bladder on them. Uh, one button, you just press the button and you can go into foam operations, which will have a significant difference on, if you will, uh, not necessarily for the usual things that foam are used for, which is uh, liquid fires and things. But now we're going to be sending out an SOP, and we're going to be changing how we deal with car fires and dumpster fires mm -hmm. so that uh, we are trying to reduce that chronic exposure time, how long firefighters are actually exposed to the carcinogens and the toxins at an event. So... And there's no reason why, once we get all these engines on board, for any firefighter to be up close and personal at a dumpster or a car fire. The foam will do the job. I mean, we, we have some issues with cars because we got to open the trunk to make sure there's nobody in them or whatever. But uh, it should reduce that chronic exposure time. That's the key to helping to, if you will, reverse this course of cancer on the fire department service. Awesome. And um, so every neighborhood is going to get a new engine. The first ones are going to be those ones I just explained to you, the dot ones, and then every one of these is going to have that foam capability, which is going to make a significant difference from a safety perspective on the fire uh, on the fire ground, and hopefully, in the longevity of these young firefighters. Okay. And then uh, on a budget issue, uh, it's a good news, bad news story. The good news is everyone wants to become a firefighter. Uh, not for me. Uh, when the building's on fire, I'm, I want to run out. I don't want to run in. I also don't want to be scaling off of a wall or going up, you know, 40 stories on, an ele on, a, uh, on a ladder. But for, for whatever reason, um, it's a desirable uh, position. And what we're seeing is a trend of um, we're training Boston police officers. They're going through the academy. We're making an investment in them. It's costing the taxpayers X amount of dollars. And then they get on the police for a specific period of time. It could be six months or it could be a year, a little longer. Then they jump. And what I'm asking, I've asked your counterpart uh, on, on the police department, if you guys would consider just getting together and when you coordinate the academies, that you do it at the same time. So when that postcard comes in, that individual has to make a selection. Because I don't think it's fair to another city yeah. resident that would, would cut off their arm to become a police officer or a firefighter, quite frankly. So what they're doing is they're playing it. They get the card, whatever comes in the mail, and then they start down that road. And you might even have instances where they're jumping from fire to police, but the trend seems to be that they're jumping from police to fire. And, and there's a real cost associated with the training, recruit investigation, the, the, the physical aptitude, the drug testing, the, the, the background checks, the psychological test. And I just want to sort of stop that and say, if we can get both the police and the fire academy to, we can walk and chew gum at the same time in Boston. No, no problem. You guys could be having your academy. They could be having their academy. But the individual gets the card, and they have to make a selection. They either got to pick, you know, they're going to go red or they're going to go blue, um, and not. And so I, I just wanted to add. I just want to ask you if, the, if you were okay with sort of coordinating something like that with uh, our fire com uh, police commissioner. He has offered to to be willing to sit down with you as well to sort of coordinate that. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, and, Councilor, just a little bit, uh, it used to be the other way around. Yeah, okay. The firefighters were jumping to become cops, and now it's the <laughs> other way. It's, it's kind of taken a change in course here. But uh, absolutely, it makes sense. Because, you know, I, I agree with you, Councilor, because some poor kid is not going to be able to fill a dream because of that. And mm -hmm. then, it, then you go back through the process, and it's right. a position can get lost, or somebody else comes out of the academy, so things like that. So I, I, I think it's a smart prudent decision and right. certainly be helpful with that. Right. And I wouldn't even, I would also be, uh, would be supportive of it at the, the specific length of a time in the academy. So say an academy starts and you're 30 days in and say someone drops out to be able to backfill that spot and allow that person, maybe if they got to stay a little longer or come in on the weekends to kind of catch up on that month that they missed. But I don't know what that sort of that drop dead period is for you guys, but for police department, I, same thing. They, they start the academy and then and th after the first week, you know, seven or eight, cadet recruits drop out, you know, whether it's the physical part of it or it's the academic part of it. And then there's six or seven seats that are kind of, they're empty, they're wasted. And I think this should be an opportunity for us to kind of have a wait list, I guess. And, and I don't know if it's a two-week period or it's a one-month period or if it's a six-week period, but it's pretty extensive uh, and exhaustive training that you have. But I would hope that there might be a window or a discussion that, you know, within a certain period of time, if someone drops out, 
uh, or gets injured that we could backfill that spot so we have a full class graduating from, from your academy. And then finally, it's something I'm working on now, and hopefully we get some input from, from you and your team. We touched on it on the Narcan, and, and you had re referenced that you're seeing sort of multiple repeat customers, if you will. Uh, but we don't have any reporting of that. Um, so you administer the Narcan, the person jumps up off the ground, and they refuse treatment, and their loved ones don't even know what happened. And so I would like to see a situation in Boston where, whether it's our fire department, our police department, or EMS administering Narcan, again, in cooperation with your respective companies, with your respective departments and the Boston Public Health Commission, that there be uh, <clears throat> mandatory transport and mandatory reporting to someone that they love or a guardian, because in too many instances we're administering it, they're jumping up off the ground and they're refusing treatment and that's it. We have no shot at trying to get treatment and recovery for that person. We have no shot of notifying their loved ones that that event actually even happened. And you're seeing this, that same individual repeating sort of the Narcan um, spin dry, if you will. So I, I just want to get your thoughts on if your department would have any opposition to uh, a transport in those situations. And that would probably be transport from either EMS or the police department transporting to, say, the city hospital and or somewhere else where we're immediately surrounding that person with wraparound services and discussing treatment and recovery and detox as opposed to just letting them walk away down, pick a street um, in Boston and and your guys go back to the station. They just saved a life, but you know they're going to be back at it again. Probably doing administering Narcan to the same individual three days later. It's we're chasing our tail on that one. So I I would like to work, and I'm I'm working with police and the drug unit now, and also through EMS. And maybe you could assign someone from your department to sure. uh, to work with me on that. I think your problem is going to be there, Council. It's just the mandatory piece. I think you're going to run into the mandate by from an individual. I, I think everybody has the right to refusal. I think unless they're mm. incoherent. But I, yeah. but I think, listen, if if there's a move and a desire, we can certainly provide some people who would be interested, who, who spearhead some things for us, that put them in the room with you right. for the and discussion. I, yeah. And I'd like to have it. If we are administering NACAN, it comes with a transport yeah. requirement or it yeah. comes with a treatment and recovery component of it. I mean, a person that's on the verge of dying doesn't know that that's happening at that moment. Right. But when we administer the NACAN, um and they jump off the ground, putting them on a gurney and taking them to the city hospital and surrounding them with professional services, I think, is more appropriate than allowing them just to walk down Broadway or walk down Main Street or walk down Center Street. You know, it's, I um, haven't had to administer an ICANN Council, no. but I'll tell you this, uh, what I'm, my reports are that um, a lot of the um, users become very combative. Yeah. They become very combative after the uh, administering of the, the NACAN. And, uh, but listen, if there's, if there's a will and we need to be thinking outside the box, I'm certainly on board. Right. And, and even on the police side, we could have a, uh, just take them into, you can PC them, you can take them into yeah. personal custody and give them the option. You want a treatment or recovery, yep. or you give them an either or. But yep. so thank you. Appreciate your thoughts yep. on that, uh, Commissioner. Keep up the great work. Thank you, Mr. Thank Mayor. you. Uh, we've been joined by District City Councilor Frank Baker and Councilor McCarthy. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Welcome, Commissioner and staff. Kathleen, brains behind it all. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, it's really nice to talk about um, the future of the fire department, uh, FY18 and all the way to FY22. A long time we've been kicking cans down the road, uh, as you know. Now we're talking about future response and future operations and future investments and the future of, uh, of um, the, the actual men and women who wear the uniform. So it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful uh, day. And uh, congratulations again on, on your, uh, your prize, North American... Uh, King of Chiefs, I think is what they call it, right? That's awesome. Um, it's uh, the in, the uniform trucks is is so cost effective with repair and maintenance. Um, some of the best case studies, whether, whether it's JetBlue or Southwest Airlines or Singapore Air, they all buy the same jets. The reason being is because the mechanics are used to fixing the same things. And um, you know, when when the commissioner talked about working well with uh, Do It. Um, I would suggest that we start working now with our own central feet, fleet. Um, Bill is doing an unbelievable job. We had our hearing last night here, um, and they're moving forward with doing a lot of in-house stuff. And I talked to Bill specifically about the Boston Fire Department, the new truck coming online, and he said they're probably not prepared to do them yet, but it might not be a bad idea to start that conversation because if we can keep our uh, costs down by keeping it in-house and taking care of our own people, um, it, it could be uh, very beneficial uh, in the very near future. 
Um, Council Flaherty uh, brought up one of the points that I want to talk about is the 53,000 new units by 2030. Um, clearly, uh, we're going to need uh, some more houses and additional uh, staff. Um, and Commissioner, you talked about the seaport area. Um, again, working with other departments, whether it's the BPDA or, or Massport, um, we should look into having uh, a very similar deal with the Intercontinental. You know, have them build your firehouse around a nice hotel or around a nice facility, and then we can move in rent free. Sounds much better than building a firehouse to me. Um, and then my last point, uh, question really is. Um, I know that you're getting back into the classroom, and um, that's awesome because I remember those days at St. Anne's when the firefighters used to go by. Richie, that was you. Yeah, Thank I got you. a picture. I got a picture of you. Yeah. So uh, we didn't learn anything when Richie was there, but it was a whole other different. But I'm sure it's much better. <laughs> lunch. I'm sure it's much better. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Boss, BPS being in the classroom, uh, <laughs> Councilor George and I have been working very hard regarding the shops, and I know she brought it up. Um, and uh, I'm working with BPS presently to, to uh, roll out a shops program to make kids aware not to pick it up. Because we had a kid jabbed uh, in our local park about two years ago now, um, and, and we just believed that she just didn't know what it was. Um, so I don't know if it, if it is part of the program, but if it could be added to the program about identifying a needle, stepping away, getting a parent, and all that stuff. Is that possible? Sure. Yeah. Now, that was nice and easy. Uh, that's it. <laughs> that's it. Thanks, Commissioner. <laughs> oh. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and um, Commissioner and team, Richie, Bobby. Thank you all for being here. Um, it speaks volumes that we've got the uh, administ the leadership of the administration plus the leadership of the union sitting side by side. I think it really shows uh, just how great morale is and mutual respect and, and admiration and, and that better for our firefighters, better for our commissioner and his staff, and most importantly, uh, better for the people of Boston. Okay. It's also good, as I often notice, it, to have Mark Siomo and Richie Paris in the same room, because people <laughs> often think they're the same person, so we can see that there are, in fact, two of them here. And uh, happy, uh, happy anniversary, uh, Mr. President, as well. Um, in all seriousness, I wanted to begin just by thanking uh, Lieutenant Mitchell and the men and women of Engine 28, Tower 10, um, I've got great firefighters across my district, but there was a, an incident uh, with a constituent who was dealing with some very, very significant health issues over the weekend, and they were remarkable. They helped her. They helped her family, and it was just a terrific thing. So thank you for that, Commissioner. I'll pass that on, Council. Absolutely. Um, and, uh, you know, similarly, I, I don't have uh, too many questions. Uh, Chief Fontana, you were kind enough to spend some time with me and Senator Rush and Rep Coppinger and... Um, some folks from Dedham, uh, as we had a public safety meeting in regard to the West Roxbury lateral pipeline, it wasn't much of a meet, uh, public safety meeting. It was run by Spectra. There was very little information that was shared. It was very frustrating from my vantage point. I was just wondering, have they um, had further communication with you? Do you feel uh, confident with uh, the way things are unfolding, sort of from Spectra's point of view? Uh, in dealing with Spectre, I mean, they, it seems like they have a very low bar, um, yeah. and, and a lot of that is protected by federal regulation. Uh, they adhere to the letter of the federal regulations that exist. Um, when you ask for emergency plans, you get basically whatever the current literature is out there from EPA or the Department of Transportation regarding uh, workbooks and, and just a lot of generalized uh, information. Uh, we've been working with Dedham Fire uh, because naturally uh, they they have a lot at stake as as well in this project, uh, and actually we met with them last week. Uh, we're going to continue to drill. Uh, we have um, basically went out to the site where the transfer station is across from the quarry. We made sure that the signage was out there. Uh, as a matter of fact, the commissioner pointed out that according to the uh, current 911 communication laws that it should be uh, posted for the citizenry to, if there is an issue, to call 911. Um, I understand what, what they want. They want you to call them first, but then something could happen where we don't get that call. So we went out there. We actually gave the site an address, which but, it didn't really have an address. Right. So. Uh, it does have an official location. If something happens at that site, at least we should get a quick response and, and quick notification. Um, but again, the, the issue itself, I, I feel your pain uh, regarding trying to get some type of 
um, specific accommodations to that particular project, but it seems to then a pipeline is a pipeline is a pipeline, regardless of whether it's in the rural uh, Midwest or whether it's in a, um, uh, a populated area. Directly uh, across the area, street so. from an active blast. So no, Chief, listen, I, I appreciate your leadership. Um, it's unsurprising, but nevertheless gratifying that you guys are working so well with your colleagues in Dedham, despite the fact or in spite of the fact that Spectra has been um, not at all helpful to the community in terms of uh, answering questions and just providing information. Regardless of that fact, you guys are still uh, doing what you can, and we appreciate that. Uh, similarly, this council in December passed a very aggressive and I think important gas piece of gas leaks legislation, which Mayor Wall signed into law right before Christmas, um, and, and that will officially go into effect with the new fiscal year in a couple months. So I know there'll be some more opportunity uh, to make sure that we can have good collaboration with your men and women out in the field to address these and fix these gas leaks going forward, which is just one part of it. Um, I think that's essentially all I have. Um, oh, you know, I know call boxes, we always bring up every budget hearing. I know they're important, but I'm just curious, Commissioner, how many, how often are the call boxes used? Because I would venture guess that most people call on their cell phones. Um, I anticipate your question. <laughs> uh, uh, so we had 85, almost 80, 85 thousand runs last year and five thousand came from a call box really okay that's a lot higher okay. than I thought. so um that's not only just the street box but the call box system is wired into the public schools to the hospitals and things like that so we have a central i mean uh, a master box system in the hotels schools you know okay. public buildings so it was five thousand in seven calls five thousand seven okay and have you any trends that have i asked this question every year because i think it's interesting any trends you've seen sort of develop um, in terms of, of causes of fire or, or just anything, anything new? I, I would tell you this, which um, it, it's a reemerging issue for us. It's careless disposal of cigarettes. Yeah. And um, for the coming near future, I would say uh, marijuana cigarettes. Mm. Because if you go back to last year, and we just had a couple of fires this past um this past month that were uh, smoking related, careless disposal, but just to kind of put it in a frame it for you, last year in, in a course of like about a 10 day period between we had a, a, like a six or seven alarm fire out in Charlestown. Two nights later, we had the fire out next door to Centapios. Mm. And then we had a fire up in Sawyer Ave in Dorchester. And those three fires caused an estimated $10 million property loss. And of that 10 million, of those three fires, each one of them was related to smoker material. One of them was, uh, which I found interesting, was uh, cigarettes being imported from Southeast Asia. Another one was uh, just a typical cigarette, and another one was a, a marijuana cigarette. And what it is is, what we're seeing is no one smokes inside no more, for the most part. So they go out on the rear porch or the front porch, have this cigarette, they flick the butt, and especially last, if you look at last summer, where we had a, I was going to call it a significant drought. Remember, we had no rain sure. for a long Absolutely, period of time. Yeah. Everything was dried out. And so it, what happened was someone discarded the cigarette. You had all the vegetation that was dry. You had, you know, probably some trash mixed in with the vegetation. It started going. No one noticed it. A little wind picked it up, and it usually starts on the rear porches. That's where we were starting to see an uptick, mm. uh, and it's troubling. But uh, and not to get into it today, but I, I think when uh, the marijuana industry comes to the city, we're going to have a, a significant number of issues around that when it comes. But we'll, we'll deal with them because that's what our counterparts in Denver and Colorado have experienced. Mm. So It's very interesting. So fewer and fewer people are smoking inside, but there's more likely that a gust of wind could yeah. you know, cause mm -hmm. the, the unsmoldered butt to, yeah. uh, to cause. That's very interesting. Okay, well. Thank you again for all your hard work and, and for your men and women out in the field. Uh, I'm very proud of the Boston Fire Department for the great you. work you guys thank do you. each and every day. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Council Presley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, uh, Councilor O'Malley. Uh, that was actually going to be my question. Um, and um, uh, I just wanted to give Councilor O'Malley a shout out. I mean, I know you have love for many people on this body, but or maybe all of us. 
um, but he's the MVP. How many fire hydrants uh, did you shovel out um, during Snowmageddon? Okay, <laughs> wonderful, wonderful initiative. Um, but thank you all for being here and uh, for what you do every day. And I appreciate uh, Councillor Campbell's point about the role that you play in community uh, beyond just uh, firefighting and prevention. Uh, mm -hmm. Very philanthropic and charity, charitable and uh, supporting so many community initiatives. Um, so thank you for that. Um, I wanted to just talk about, um, I'm very pleased that we've made um, a strategic investment relative to wellness um, overall. So uh, um, to reduce cancer risk, um, uh, things that we're doing relative to prevention, to reduce heart attacks and things like that. But I had a question about behavioral health because I think that is something that is overlooked often um, with those in public safety positions. And I was just wondering um, what, if anything, is being done in that regard to, to support? We actually, um, uh, it's a great question because uh, firefighters are no different than the average population. I like to refer to firefighters if there's a, something going on in the community, it's going on in the firehouse. It's going on in, with firefighters. So behavioral health, we have a very robust EAP program. Uh, it's nationally recognized as the leader in the fire service community. Sorry, what's the acronym, Commissioner? The EAP. Okay. Uh, we got a very robust EAP program. Um, and part of our initiative around O2X, which is helping us in this holistic approach to health and wellness, uh, which is going to reduce, hopefully we're going to see some of the cardiac issues reduced and the cancer re right. reduction around mm -hmm. nutrition. There's a whole behavioral component to it. So we're training everybody in the behavioral component. Okay. How to deal with stress sleep deprivation, uh, substance issues, uh, suicide uh, ideation, things like that. So we are working uh, through uh, the wellness program in the department around the whole issue around behavioral health. Uh, we, we're no different than the rest of the community. Well, I appreciate that. But, but to that point, um, you know, we all, you know, again, my condolences and I, um, around firefighter Toscano, um, but you know, this is a unique situation. I mean, I think you're exposed to things um, that um, you're very unique people uh, to do, go out and brave and to do these things all, all the time. So I appreciate your willingness to say, just like everybody else, but sort of like you're dealing with um, daily challenges and very unique ones as well. Um, so I did just want to ask the question. I do ask this of, you know, uh, behavioral health is just an area we're all passionate about, and I ask this for everyone. So I'm not, I'm not, um, um, you know, uniquely seeking you out. Yeah. But I just want to make sure that folks are feeling uh, supported in that way. And I didn't know when there is, you know, a loss, if uh, it is mandatory that people are, are seeing someone or sort of what are the processes around that? Yeah. Because you guys are experiencing trauma, again, just like everyone else so, in the city, but it's exacerbated, I think. So, Council, we, we are, as the Commissioner stated, we have some partnerships with our EAP through other, um, for behavioral help, help. But a lot of times, what we find is the person with the needs the help is not asking for the help. Right. So what we try to do is we have a training program for the firefighters to recognize what's going on. Okay, very good. To make, to, so you're not on an island by yourself. He might just go and isolate himself or she might just go and isolate herself in a firehouse and not make a um, problem. And when we get the problem at personnel or at headquarters, it's a big problem. So we're trying to get them to recognize what's going on and say, do you need help, or to talk to somebody, okay, or come great. to us and say, if they don't feel comfortable talking, <coughs> come to us and we'll talk to them. Another side of this is uh, every recruit class for the last four, we welcome the families in. It's a similar part of the program like the police have. We bring the families in. We make out a, a refrigerator magnet with all health, behavioral health, and drug help, and we ask them to put it on the on the refrigerator. You might not need it ever. You might need it in 10 years. We figured that's going to be something that's going to be okay, there. Great. We reach out to the families and we explain, you guys are the ones seeing them every day. If, you get, if they're showing some signs of anything, contact okay, us. Okay, excellent. All right, thank you very much. I okay. appreciate, appreciate that. Um, and then I, I did just want to, um, uh, to Councillor O'Malley's point around trends, and then you were talking about the public education programs and uh, youth and vulnerabilities around uh, seniors. Um, uh, and the like, and you had goals for that, and you and you uh, hit all of those. Um, do we find that when you make these investments in public education campaigns that we can see, you know, a reverse in the trend of something? Um, I think about uh, sort of carbon monoxide poisoning, and it sure. seemed that when we had a targeted 
um, campaign and made those investments that we saw those numbers downtrend. So, absolutely, I did, probably the most successful uh, public education campaign was that stop, drop, and roll. Everyone knew what it yeah. was. You know, that was probably the most successful campaign uh, initiated. But you, you certainly see on the national level the trends, and like we're not we're not reinventing the wheel here. We we following what has been proven as good practices nationally around okay. this, especially around elderly. Elderly and children are the most vulnerable populations when it comes to fire deaths. If you look at fire deaths, those are the two populations that um, significantly impact it. So we we focused the public edu education campaign around those two unique demographics to uh, hopefully see the difference in the trends. And I think we will. I think we're and gonna... so and you can sort of be nimble and adjust. So where you're seeing an increase, then you think about how to customize the campaign to address something like that. So as you said, you're thinking about um, with the legalization of, of uh, recreational marijuana, um, thinking ahead. Exactly. And learning best practices from what you've seen in other municipalities in that space. Exactly. Okay. All right. Um, on the uh, diversity front, one, I just want to thank you for presenting the MWBE vendor and contracting information. That's something I've asked about in the past, and so mm -hmm. I appreciate your coming with that uh, proactively. Um, and thank you, uh, you know, for that, just to making sure that there's an equity and opportunity in terms of procurement and contracting. So yeah. encouraged to see um, that many MWBE uh, contractors. Um, and then um, as far as um, our very dedicated diversity officer, I did just want to ask some more questions and dig in there. Sure. So um, because he's only one person and although, um, you know, very dedicated in this endeavor, um, to get our numbers to be commiserate with representation in the city is going to require a lot. And so we thank you for your willingness and your commitment, and we're, we're pleased that the position has been created. But I just wanted to know sort of what is his budget? Does he have any staff? Um, is there a break? So is the entire budget just his position? Um, and uh, is there a, a marketing or outreach budget? And uh, what are sort of the, the metrics where we'll uh, best gauge if we're being successful? Because right now it seems to be mostly outreach and then sort of tracking what those outreach uh, vehicles and contacts have been. I went to this school, I went to this event, that sort of thing. So I would tell you that his bud the budget is his position, but we okay. util we're utilizing a lot of um, staff uh, for events. Uh, we have people that are helping assist one. When I say firefighters on a day off, we'll We'll put them to work at a different event. We bring uh, the public education people into into the mix, and so on. Uh, we certainly need to expand on that as we move truly into trying to make a difference in this, which we are. And the um, we have a lot of off-duty time firefighters that are helping now too. And we have, we're trying we're working with the Vulcans. We're going to be working okay, with the Vulcans a, to try to question. yeah. We're going to we've had some great discussion with Daryl. Uh, Higginbottom actually okay. about coming together and uh, some of the initiatives they have, and we want to partner with them on some of what they're doing. Um, so we're trying to make best use of everyone's time. And I mentioned the uh, the basketball program yeah. and Roosevelt Robinson was a great. I don't know if you know Roosevelt at all. He's um, he's heavily involved at Madison, and he's uh, a firefighter for us at Engine Fifty One. But um, he's come and he's talked about what we need to do as far as establishing some athletic leagues and things like that. So as we try to cement. The blueprint of what we're going to be going forward. Well, we certainly need to put additional resources once we have a strategic plan okay. on how best to move so that forward. So the goal right now is really focused on informing aspiration yep. early on in sort of outreach and then also uh, trying to increase this, this, uh, our diversity numbers more targetly through our, our veterans community? True. Okay. So you'll be, you're also working with veterans organizations that are predominantly um, black or Latino? Yes. Or, okay. All right. And then um, is, is part of the officer's job also to be more focused in onboarding more women? It's certainly part of the uh, process. And again, the, the, the women, that, the dynamic falls very similar on the, um, on the minority dynamic around veteran status. I mean, women, there's no differentiation between male and female in the veteran status or a hiring process. And then where we, we see the trouble in the female side in, is them their inability to get through some of the physical standards, and that's ministered at the state level. State level, I know so, we're looking at that. It's a barrier for a lot of women for police as well. Yeah, it, it's a barrier for us also, and so 
that's the groups we need to be working with to try to get that to, certainly we want people to be able to form the essential job functions, but also not to have some artificial barrier okay. in the process. And I think right now we're at about 4% uh, where women uh, are concerned. It's pro I think it's 28, 20 females, I think is, was the number. Okay. All right. And then my, my, uh, my final question, um, and I thank the chair and my colleagues for their patience, is just could you remind me what the residency requirements are? It's the residency requirement is that upon the date of the exam, you need to be a resident of the, the city of Boston one year prior to the date of the exam. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Councilor Zakum. Now, uh, Richie, also, obviously, I think it's, uh, wanna, I don't want to completely echo everyone else, but it's nice to see everyone here um, talking largely on the same page about some of the important work uh, going on in the city of Boston. Um, I want to just piggyback on, on Councilor Presley, um, what she just said about making diversity a focus. I mean, it's clearly an issue uh, with all of our public safety agencies and seeing the focus uh, from the top, from you, Commissioner, and your team um, is obviously where, where it has to start. And I certainly want to be as supportive as I can moving forward and working towards a place where we have, you know, folks that are on the fire department that are representing people in the neighborhoods of the city of Boston. I think both from a paro parochial standpoint in that, you know, we want Bostonians um, in these jobs and, you know, one year residency requirement. I know um, our colleague, Councilor Flaherty, has been, been working on that a little bit to make sure that folks are really from here and not just sort of just coming in to get on, yeah, to get on the best fire department uh, in the country. So um, that's something that I think uh, really could help um, with that diversity and help make sure that these uh, Boston jobs are going to Bostonians, and I think that benefits everyone. Um, so thank you for your efforts on that. Um, you, you said something earlier that uh, sparked a bit of interest in me, no pun intended, um, on uh, marijuana cigarettes causing fires. Um, I, you know, I know that commercially made cigarettes, you know, Marlboros, those are, have some requirements on being self-extinguishing. Um, you know, obviously it's not perfect. They certainly do lead to a lot of fires, but there's makes me think that there's probably nothing in regulations for marijuana cigarettes, certainly not the ones that folks are rolling themselves aren't going to have that. Is that anything you've seen or heard about in other states that have legalized marijuana? The one state that I, uh, we've had some communication with, and certainly the city, is, is Denver, mm. Colorado and Denver. And um, they've certainly seen an uptick on their fire volume around that. Mm. Um, and a lot of it wasn't so much centered on just the cigarette. It was on the extraction process. Uh, where um, the uh, trying to make the now I'm gonna I'm not a edibles. chemist here, so uh, <laughs> making edibles and yeah, extracting yeah. and making the uh, THC more potent, uh, if you will. That's where they seem because the process requires using butane and propane. Okay. Which um, and when people have self-growing uh, going on in their own residence, it's problematic, and people get a little careless, and mm. things start to. The more ignition factors you can in, introduce into an environment, the more fires you're going to have. It's, yeah. it's a simple. That's a simple equation. So um, they've had they had a, some some significant explosions in their neighborhoods, mm. um, and that's where they were dealing with it. What makes it problematic in Boston for me is um, we got a whole different neighborhood than Denver. When I say that, just look at the congestion. Look at East Boston, wood frame structures, South Boston, wood frame, Charlestown, uh, not then the Back Bay. Mm -hmm. So we have some potential for large loss, mm -hmm. you know, as the, the frequency or the addition of this process comes, on, comes online. I think we're going to have some Challenges. So it's the, it's the home manufacturing as opposed to people carelessly throwing a joint on the on the ground. Well, I think there's council. I think it's uh, again carelessly disposal. Yeah. I mean, but also I think from what I've heard from my colleagues in Denver, it's more around the uh, extraction, the home extraction okay. process, because the manufacturing of the product for the edibles and things like that are done in a controlled environment, controlled setting doesn't seem to be the issue. Yeah. It's the fact that people can actually grow, have a significant number of plants at their house. And then you look at Council Sonoma's uh, neighborhood where you've got all these transient college kids down in Austin who come into a, a building and, you know, how many plants can each one of those kids have and what, what's that going to look like? Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. So, I mean, there's some significant issues that I see coming forward on that. Like, oh, thank you. That's uh, something that hadn't, you know, I think occurred to many folks uh, in the discussion about marijuana, but, you know, for um, obviously the medicinal being a different standard than the sure. recreational, which is, which is on, the, on the way to us now. Um, and then uh, my last comment is I just want to uh, thank you and, and Richie for, you know, the partnership we had over the you know, last couple of years on um, the flame retardants in our, in our furniture. I actually just received a report from um, the Silent Spring Institute, which is one of the scientific organizations working with us, um, showing the differences um, since the changes have been made in communities like Boston and the reduction uh, of the chemicals. And it's, it's having a significant impact. So I want to thank you for your willingness um, to work together on that. And it's, uh, you know, it's a small thing, but when we're talking about cancer rates for the men and women in the fire department, and the city at large, I think anything we can do uh, is important. So thank you for that. I want to thank you for your diligence, Council. You kept my feet to the fire. No, we, had some, we had some good meetings. <laughs> no pun intended. Yeah, right. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chair. Councilor Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good, good morning, Joe, and, and, and all your, your team here. Actually, good afternoon. It's one, almost 1 o'clock. Um, and also on top of the, the extractions, the home grows. We're talking about overloaded electric oh, services yeah. and, and crazy lamps, lights. And, lamps and yeah, yeah, and yeah, yeah. That's what, so we did, we did a, a tour in Denver and a lot of fires in, in garages from people, yep. you know, trying to, trying to grow. Um, Joe, can you talk a little bit about the, <clears throat> the, um, how we're decontaminating the stations? How many stations, you know, the deep cleans? How many stations are we looking at doing? Uh, how do we come up with a state? I mean, ultimately, I think we'd want to do all the stations, sure. but how are we prioritizing? And w- what about is the general cost going to be? So we actually had um, we had a company come in and, get, and try to cost it out for us. You know what? We, what and we gave them kind of scope of work, Frank. We gave council. We went to like what we're looking to do and things. So we're looking to decrease the floors, the walls, power wash everything, clean all the air handling systems, the diesel recovery systems. Uh, kitchens, walls, everything that where we know there's contaminants. And when I say that, if you think about the average age of the houses and, and long before diesel recovery and fire engines pulling in and pulling out, you can imagine how much benzene's embedded in the uh, the walls, the ceilings, and things, right? So in discussing with the mayor, we, we talked about what would be a good number and what would be a pilot, because this is a new endeavor. This yeah. is something that we wanted to do. So... We went, the mayor and I discussed that we went with, uh, the mayor was gracious enough to give us $500,000, and I'm hoping to get three to four done with $500,000, yeah. because as you well know, Councilor, as we go into these houses, there's gonna be, we're going to find things wrong, yeah. especially the age, so we're going to find things, and we want to paint, we want to we take out all the soft fabric yeah. furnishings and things like that where things are embedded, we want to, and then replace them, so... This is a pilot, so we're going to see how far that 500 takes us, and yeah. then hopefully next year we'll have a better handle and maybe we'll do additional fire. Yeah. So when we're looking at clean and we're looking at some some you know painting upgrades, absolutely. Sort of yeah, yeah we, that makes that makes sense. You know, seal the walls, ceilings, all that stuff. You know, yeah. seal living. And what's the average age of, the, of 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 our firehouses? The average age is 76 years old. Yeah. The average yeah. age. So I get the firehouse in Engine 50 in Charlestown, which is going under a. Almost a four million dollar renovation is goes back to eighteen fifty. So you can see brick structure, brick structure, nice old house, just neglected and needs you know the upgrade. But sits in the community. You never even know it if you're dri- driven by it. You wouldn't even know yeah. it's a firehouse till you come right up on top of it. It's a nice uh, historical place. Is it is the is the structure there itself uh, enough to fill your needs over there, or should we be looking at a new station over there? That firehouse fills the need where it is yeah, in, the, in the neighborhood, the size and the neighborhood it protects. It, it fills the need, um, and I, I'm comfortable with with the that investment because that's certainly a house that uh, has a and they're a busy house. When I say busy, they're um, they do a lot of traveling around the city. When there's something major in the city, that's one of the companies that moves frequently because they can get they, they can get, get there quickly, frequently, and we also have some redundancy down in Sullivan Square with 32 and 9 down by the Shrafts building. Yeah. They can pick up their response as we move them out. So uh, the, the, the firehouses are problematic. I'm, yeah. I'm not, I can't sit here and tell you they're not. So Charlestown is probably as much about location than it is size That one for sure because there's, there's no other way to go, I don't think, in that neighborhood unless you were in the Navy yet, and I, yeah. I don't think that is feasible. So, so this first round it would just be a pilot, and we're only looking at maybe four stations if we stretch it. 
I'd be really happy if we got to four. Yeah. Because I think what's going to happen, Councilor, is, is we just both came to the conclusion is as, as we go in there and we start peeling back that onion, yeah, we're going to realize that there's a lot of other things. Yeah, I mean, have we looked at them as far as, you know, asbestos and, and, and things like, like has has that been remediated over over the years? Like, have we gotten rid of asbestos? Because I know we not, have. Not all the houses. Yeah. No, not all the houses. So we've, we're going to have discussions with whoever the contractor will be yeah. about that. Um, asbestos remediation is expensive. Yeah. So uh, we, we've kind of focused on exactly what we want to do as far as cleaning. So, and we, and to be honest, uh, we haven't picked or decided which houses are going to go first. Mm -hmm. We're waiting to try to evaluate. We'll probably do one or two in each side of the city so yeah. uh, to see which we have and probably want to undertake something that will not become a beer, you know, kind of get one that needs it, but maybe has a single engine or something in there. So we get a feel for what, how it's going to yeah. come together, yeah. what to anticipate as we go forward with some of the bigger firehouses and, and see where we're at, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, can you talk a little bit about, uh, the, <clears throat> the engine 17, it says it's, it, it's just to be scheduled. Like, can you, can you lay out a time frame and, and maybe like what the discussion with the church is and uh, are they, are they on board? Cause I know meeting house Hill would talk about, I, right. I, I, I know, like I, ideally I think would want to get that, that out towards the, the street front. Is there any yeah. discussions about that? And we, we've met with the church on a couple of times. They've been very gracious to the church community up there is phenomenal. We met with them, told them what we were thinking of doing. Uh, I, was under, I was under the impression that what we have fenced in up there is what we own. Mm -hmm. It's not the case. Mm. The church owns it. So they've been gracious to fence in an area for us for our park our vehicles and things. So if you're looking at that firehouse standing in front, we only own 20 feet to the right. Yeah. And the church owns everything down to the street corner. It makes perfect sense to move that firehouse down to the street corner. There is one impediment there, whereas it, there's a lot of ledge in Roxbury pudding stone that needs to be uh, extracted, yeah. which will add cost to the project. But moving that and having a, a really visible public safety building in that area, that neighborhood, I think would be uh, very beneficial. And the church is about it. The church yeah. is very comfortable with that. That was their concern, because when we initially talked about and Engine 17 is one of the worst houses we have in the city as far as age and things. There used to be three floors to it. Yeah. They took a floor off, and it's, it's a very uh, old, tied in one place. But the church said, well, did you ever entertain bringing it down to the street corner? And I said, that makes perfect sense. And it gets us out of the traffic up at the math of school yep. when school's in session and when it's dismissal time where the apparatus is not you know, interfacing with the children, uh, parents dropping off their kids. And I think that would free up that whole top of the hill. Hey, what's the white, what's the white structure next to the, we don't own that, do we? The, no. There's like a little church. It's a, a little a church. Different church in there a different also, church. Right? It used to be a post at one point in time, but it's a little, it's a little church. And I'm not quite sure the denomination, but it's a small little church at the top. Yeah. So that, <clears throat> so that sounds like to pull all this together, we're probably a couple years out. Uh, we did. Say. We've done some geotech studies already. Yeah. We've appraised the property. We've done some geotech study on the on the um, on the ledge. Mm -hmm. We just need to kind of put it together now. Yeah. Because because sometimes I wonder, you know, with all the development that's going to happen there, that's the Glover's Glover's Corner um, whole whatever they're calling it. Um, so you you wonder if maybe it would be worthwhile and this may be logistics for you to look at something that's going to be built down there and do the same thing firehouse on the on the bottom floor of a of a larger building may not work you may you know we may want to be right up there in meeting house hill to get to bowden street and the, and the rest of it there that's just kind of putting the back of your head there joe because yeah. there's going to be quite a bit of building going on there they, I tell you, they, and you're aware of a council, they had a significant fire up there uh, two Sundays ago. Yeah. And the proximity, uh, that firehouse, as far as response times in their, in their first due area, uh, they did a great job saving that block. Yeah. I'll tell you, if, that, if, that, if those companies didn't get there when they did, we could have lost that whole block. That could have been a Bellflower Street. Yeah. The thing that saved us, too, was the fact that the expediency where they got there, but also that there was no wind. 
if we had a wind condition that morning, that probably would have traveled all the way down Mount Ida Road and maybe even jumped it because there was some significant volume of fire upon arrival, and they were very close to the, um, they were up there in like three minutes, and that fire advanced that quickly. Yeah. So, so let's talk about that fire a little bit, Joe. Is, is there anything, because <clears throat> I, this is actually, it seems like yesterday, but I'm in my sixth year now in, in, this, in this position. Um, and ever since, ever since day one, the buildings up there, we have Mount Ida, Marie Street. I mean, Marie Street was owned, was owned by a realtor. She's had it like that for probably 15 years, kind of looks like she's working on it. And, and we can't. We can't, as a city, legally move those people. I mean, everybody knows the real estate. Like, you'd be able to sell them in a in a second. Right. But for whatever reason, the owners up there is. Is there anything that you can think of that um, may be a tool for us in the neighborhoods to help move properties like that along? Like with 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 the help from the fire department, because obviously. Ultimately, the worst thing that could happen is what did happen. It, it goes on fire and now affects, you know, however many houses around it. So everybody there is affected. They've been looking at they've been looking at this house for ten years, calling the city. What are you guys doing? And and because they pay enough taxes or, or whatever, they, they 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 do the bare minimum to hold that house. Is there something different that we should be looking at from a public safety standpoint to move these along? Because there's. A, I think there's three buildings up there that are in the same spot, you know, that, that, that are right next to each other, and, it, and, and we can't do anything to it. Any thoughts around that? Well, Council Baker, <laughs> last one, last one. We can talk about that after. And, and last thing, if I can get a quick rundown on, on, on where we are, the, um, the, um, the cadet program. Are we, is that still in talks? Are we talking about that, that at all? Any sort of discussion there? We haven't had any real formal discussion about mm -hmm. it. It's not off the table. We're looking at the overall picture of what we need to do around yeah. diversity and, and things of that nature on that. Um, there's, and I've mentioned this a million times, Council. There's, there's a lot of uh, complexity with that as far as the fire department versus the police department. Right. Uh, the fire department, I mean, you try in this day and age versus 40 years ago when the police cadet program was established. Uh, veterans view this as a discriminatory practice if you talk to them. It's a way to circumvent their process. And when you talk and look at where they are and, and the conflicts we've been engaged in for the last 15 years, uh, and there's been a lot of federal law that's come down in support of veterans hiring and so on, and state law. Veterans protect the class. Veterans protect an under MCAD. So there's a lot of complexity around that topic versus when it was established 40 years ago mm -hmm. in the environment we're in today versus the environment we were in then. Right. And I think um, there needs to be discussions. I think we need to yeah. think about it and where it goes and put the right people at the table and, and see if there's a feasible because there's a right way and a wrong way in the diversity thing in my mind on how mm -hmm. best we can get achieve those goals. And, um, and we just have to see. Okay. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, Commissioner. You're welcome. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Councilor Jackson. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, and I want to uh, thank the commission. I want to congratulate you on your award. Well, thank you. Um, you are uh, definitely uh, a credit to um, us nationally, and uh, I, again, uh, kudos on, on your award. I also want to acknowledge uh, President Paris and uh, uh, Vice President uh, Petiti uh, for the great work uh, that the men and women that you represent uh, on a regular basis uh, do um, to ensure that we are uh, a, a very safe city. Um, and I know uh, in June there is um, a, a, a uh, the tr I know there's a plaque over on Tremont Street um, that com commemorates um, some folks who uh, passed away. Um, and we will uh, be there uh, to, to ensure that we uh, commemorate them uh, properly. But, uh, but again, thank you uh, thank for you. the work that you do. Um, I wanted one to hear about the, um, the wellness Online item, sure. and it's actually something that I wish I had seen in the police department, um, because I, it sounds like, and, I, and I've heard people rave about um, the the program that you're uh, that you've rolled out. Um, so if you can give us an update on uh, how the program has been uh, working, and hopefully, Mr. Chair, we get a we get a city council wellness program uh, also. But could, can you let us know a little bit about sure. this? Sure. Um, well. We Councilor, I think you're aware of it was one of the early initiatives that uh, when I took the position as commissioner, I, I approached Mayor Walsh about 
Um, we've had over 190 Boston firefighters succumb to an occupational cancer and since 1990. Uh, we've had a number of cardiac, sun cardiac deaths mm -hmm. also since 1990. And um, it's certainly a major concern. So we've changed how we operate tactically on the fire ground and we've done some things that are around longer respiratory protection and so on. But the wellness piece, we felt the need to engage people outside of the fire service to look at a holistic approach mm -hmm. to health and wellness. We've been working with O2X, which is a group of former Navy SEALs, who their, their approach to health and wellness not only goes, they, they want to create tactical athletes. That's their term. They want to create firefighters and make them tactical athletes. Uh, we've seen some reductions in our musculoskeletal injuries. We've seen where it's been beneficial. And even when someone does uh, incur an injury, their return to duty time is a lot quicker. So we're starting to see the positive impact there. And we're also seeing the positive impact around um, nutrition, sleep patterns, behavioral health, stress management, which is all components of the whole health and wellness mm -hmm. initiative with O2X. And I, it's probably the most successful program that we've had um, moving forward in that arena because we've tried and launched throughout the years a couple other health and wellness initiatives that, you know, flash in the pans. This is long term, and we have changed the culture and thought process. We have whole firehouses now that all engage in the O2X philosophy the morning they come into work. They do the workout. They, they buy and they shop healthy. They make sure they do take their 10 minutes or 15, 20 minutes out and do the meditation component. They do a lot of it together as, a, as a, like a team building concept. And I got to thank all those company officers who really embraced it because they're the ones who bring it. That's where the rubber meets the road for the fire department mm -hmm. is at that company level, that lieutenant and captain making a difference. And they've done a great job embracing it to the point where we'll hopefully have the whole department trained in the next 18 months. We initially rolled it out that we were going to do a train the trainer program. We were going to train like 40 members and have them go back to each individual firehouse and bring the philosophy and concepts back. We realized we're so well received that we felt the need. Why don't we train the entire department? Mm -hmm. We've incorporated into recruit training. So the very first week of the academy, the recruits go through the O2X philosophy and concepts. They, they, they are taught the O2X way. From the very first day, they're in the academy. And to see the embrace, and we've seen the dramatic increase of their output. We measure them when they come into the academy, and then we measure them when they're leaving. And they're like pull-ups and push-ups, and everything has increased like 10, 20, 30-fold. Collectively, one group lost over 300 pounds as a group, and there was like 50 of them in the group. So it's a very great program, and our members can relate to them. They're all former military, so they, re they relate to the, uh, the Navy SEALs concept, and, and they have a great way of how they, uh, how they get the course accomplished. They just have a real good dynamic, mm -hmm. and it works well. And um, I, I've, again, heard uh, many great things um, uh, about uh, O2X. And I, I hope that uh, our other um, uh, emergency, emergency agencies uh, begin to, uh, to think about that. I think it's really uh, innovative that you've put it in to uh, uh, really centered your training around wellness, right? right? Which, and we obviously know that uh, the beginning of uh, academies are, is generally the most stressful for, right. uh, for most folks. And the fact that you uh, have actually made that move to put it in the uh, beginning, I think, is really uh, something that we should think about. And hopefully we could see this extended over uh, to um, the, the folks uh, in, in the police as well as our, our EMS right. services. Um, would you recommend this to uh, why? Oh, yeah. I, I mm -hmm. actually, we've, we've actually held a few seats. We've had, I've I talked to Jimmy Hooley, and Jimmy's put some of his people through it. And okay. uh, he thought it was well, it was well received by his folks. And yep. No one's gone through it. It's the most well-received training we've ever done. That's, That's the best way to describe it. That's great. And it sounds like it also will save uh, the city a lot of money over the course of time. Long-term, um, it should. And, and we're, um, money is not the only thing that we look at saving. It's we want people literally to be well because we want them to go back to their families and, and also be well. I'll give you a statistic. One cardiac event costs the city on average about $500,000. Close. Between the indemnification, the lost time, backfill over time, and then the potential retirement, depending on how significant the event is. If we can prevent one cardiac issue, it's paid for itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and the fact and I that guess, 
Uh, the fact that we, we're preventing a number of them is great. Definitely. definitely. Um, I also wanted just to hear around that there's a 14.36% increase in training and a 16.87% in increase in uh, maintenance. Um, I just wanted to hear what uh, what's entailed in um, the, the increases there. The training piece I would attribute to the fact that we just got a $500,000 increase from the state training grant. Okay. And we've used that and aligned our training. We've had additional training. Uh, we've initiated a number of other programs around that additional 500000 FY FY16's budget, we were at $1.75 million from the state. This, this past year, we were able to go to $2.25, uh, which has added a number of programs, and that's where that increase on the training side comes. Mm -hmm. I'll let Kathleen answer the uh, yeah, and the, on the maintenance, I think it's just the switch between the repairs in the buildings that went into the repairs for equipment, and it was for radios, so the radios shouldn't have been in repairs for buildings, so it went into equipment. So mm -hmm. that's where you saw the increase. So, so net, net, that that would have, would, it would have been an, another another line, right? Um, correct. That it, you should have seen a corresponding decrease. Where, where do we where do we find that? Um, are you, are you looking on page 167? Yep. That's where I'm looking. Okay. Yep. Yeah, so if you see the repairs to the buildings, repairs for buildings and structures would have mm -hmm. gone down, and then you would, see, would have seen the increase in the equipment. It was just a switch between those categories. Okay. Okay. Good. Um, all of my other questions uh, were asked. Um, I, again, thank you for, for the work that you do. Actually, the one other piece, I, I do think it is really critical. Um, that we have a department that actually looks like the communities that they, that they serve. Um, and I think it is important that we move urgently um, towards um, uh, any and all methodologies that allow for uh, more access and a department that's a greater reflection um, of these communities. And I think even when it comes to um, the uh, veterans' preference, the armed services are, are pretty diverse. And so I think it, it is, you know, that, that is one of the th things that I, I continue to hear. I have many family members who are in, in the armed service. And so I think it's really important that we're thoughtful about not only um, uh, how uh, we diversify here, but also how we recruit nationally um, around, around this. So I think I, we know that there's a, a new uh, officer that you have um, in, in the diversity office. But I think we really need to uh, roll our sleeves up and figure out on a process side um, of things. And, and I, I heard you say, um, I, I think a proactive approach to the language piece is the right way also. Yeah. We shouldn't have to point to a tragedy but, because there was a, a language difficulty for us to say, hey, now we need to make a, ch make a change. Um, that's not in the business. Uh, that's not in either of our businesses. Um, you save lives on a day-to-day -day basis. And so I, th I just think it's really important um, that we uh, move swiftly towards by figuring out how to be um, more inclusive in um, terms of uh, the representation um, that, that we see. I think it's uh, really a value of our city. I couldn't agree with you more, Council. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, uh, Commissioner, I just wanted to follow up on the uh, status of the relationship with Boston Fire Department and Harvard, the training facility over on Holton Street. I believe we're still good. <laughs> yeah. is, it, is it month to month? It's, I, I, Council, I'd have to get back to because I'm not, um, right. I haven't. I don't think there's any plans for development there. They've been, but, they've been great with us yeah. and, and they've been very accommodating. And, and I have no reason to believe that there's going to be any imminent right. movement. I just right. think uh, long term, we certainly got to be thinking about it. And, you know, when you start looking at our facilities and things like that, that facility over there, we're blessed. I mean, we'd have nowhere else to. to right how Special Operations Command, where, uh, what they do. Right. I mean, that's a big component of our day-to-day -day, uh, business model. I mean, uh, terrorism, sea burning, all that stuff. They do a great job. And, and marijuana now. Oh, <laughs> marijuana coming. I mean, we, several of us went on that trip to Denver, and uh, that was one of the um, you know, important issues that came up within city government and how they approached it they had like team meetings around it and that was uh one of the most dangerous outcomes right. of the extraction that you mentioned and uh the grows the in-house grows created the most danger so i hope i know we're maybe a year out or more 
but um, I hope those conversations are, are starting with ISD, with BFD, and all the other departments. Yeah, work with the mayor. We've we've yeah. been together talking. I mean, different task force. He's got uh, Jerome Smith running through it, right. and, and Buddy and I have been talking. And uh, you know, Denver just used Denver for a minute. They created a whole That's inspection right. division around it. That's right. And yeah. I would tell you this: is that we have a much more vulnerable city right. than Denver. We're much more compact, compact, and dense, dense, old construction. Right. right. Very vulnerable to fire and fire spread. So we get a very different neighborhood than Denver, yeah. and posing you know, a, a, an even greater, a danger. greater threat yeah. here. And absolutely, and, which concerns me. Yeah, it really does concern me, especially Council in your neighborhood. Yeah, when you get out to yeah. uh, the area down in Ralston, where we've had yeah, some the tragedies. Gap area, right? We, we've had a number yeah. of tragedies down there, mm -hmm. and I just see this becoming another issue, mm -hmm. a bigger issue, with more tragedies. Yeah, if we're not on top of it. Agree. So, so I appreciate any proactive yep. measures that you and other city departments are taking at this point. Well, thank you, Councilor. Thanks. Thank you, Councilor Savi George. Um, thank you, Chair. I have a couple, just a few sort of wrap-up questions. Um, we talked a lot earlier about the SAFER grant, mm -hmm. um, and I understand that's coming to an end, but is that something that we can continue to reapply for? We or did. Is we it re gone? No, we reapplied this year for 65 positions right. and we won't know until the summer if we right. if we've been funded for all and, but is that something that will continue to be an opportunity after fiscal year 18 yes we can oh, keep great. and actually uh there, i seen some news on one of my uh websites that i frequent around the fire service in that it's in the budget this year the president's budget and so on save it to keep them funded the great. save your grant stuff so that, that's wonderful to hear because yeah. i thought that maybe it ended after totally ended. No. Um, and then on the on hazmat, the hazmat recovery fund and the hazmat team response. There's last year we had an appropriation for fiscal year 17, but it's not in the fiscal year 18 budget. The hazmat grant. Um, it's called. I'm. Ref, it's references like the recovery fund and then the hazmat team response. Is that the 21 Yeah. I'd have to check on the hazmat recovery fund. I believe that might have been um, from the uh, DEP. And we got some equipment that we were able to stagger around the city. And I have to see if that is a repeating. Um, but we do get a, we, we have been consistently getting the hazmat grant, which I don't know if there's some confusion there. But um, we've been Kate's having... thinking that maybe it's from an old revolving fund. Right. And yeah, so currently we're getting about 237000 clear on a hazmat, state hazmat grant that has been reoccurring annually. Okay. We do have a revolving fund for hazmat recovery, and we also get a, um, a hazmat overtime for this, from the state fire service. So we still have those. Okay. Um, no, I think what it was in last year's appropriation and then not in this year, so we just had some confusion on it. Um, I don't know whether the confusion's been cleared up, but that's, that's fine. Um, for me, we can do a little bit more digging. And then I know we talked about the reduction in overtime by 6.5%. I think that's great yep. and happy to hear um, that you're going to continue striving to do that. Uh, but, but when there is a need for overtime um, and we're continuing to see overtime, Perhaps we're not budgeting the right outs. So, you know, so where are we seeing the most need for overtime, and why aren't we just making it part of what we're doing? The most need for overtime comes with the division strength, which is um, probably the peak period of our year around that starts in the major vacation period, which is end of April into uh, mid-September is where we start to see that peak, and it's uh, contractually members, are, uh, they have their vacations assigned, right. but every other year they're in guaranteed prime vacation. That's considered the prime time, and so we see a bunch of vacation in there that, that drives some of that, um, where it, it probably it's prudent when you look at it as far as in those less vacation period times where you don't would need the staffing. Right. So it, it's more prudent to... Oh, staff at that point for those prime or those peak periods. 
And so I think when we talk about overtime, we talk about it negatively, but we do have to provide vacations and we should, we should provide it when, you know, people want to take it and take trips to their families if it's school vacation weeks and all that. So I think that maybe we've got to stop talking about overtime as such a negative and talk about it as something we need to do. Um, And so perhaps maybe we just need to change some of our language around that. Sure. I, you know, (laughs) Sure, sure. Uh, the president is smiling over there. <laughs> I'll roll with that. Yeah. No, I, I and, and we, some things, though, counselor, are driven by unexpected. Right. You know, so like we'll have, you know, we'll have a fire and we'll, seven or eight guys will get hurt, which drives the cost. And then we'll have special events in the city that drive cost. And then we'll have, you know, protests and marches and things like that. We get it that drives cost. So, um, it's not as predictable as as I would like it to be, because then you could really figure out where the loopholes are or where where things are. But it it does have a number of unpredictable components to it, on you know right. forecastable component components. So maybe I mean it's the accountants in the room that are creating this stir, but it, it's no. it's just something that happens, it and does. it's something you know. Of course, we want to be as prepared as possible because there's a financial. Um, implication, but I, I don't think we should talk about needing overtime to cover for injuries, to uh, cover for certain vacations. Uh, as well, it just like when you, when you talk about that reduction and not to belabor this, is that um, with the additional people we hired with that seventy on that seventy five that safer grant, we have additional staffing in the field, which has helped bring that down. You know what I mean? So we have a little more of a cushion by about 20, 30 people, I believe, in the field, which has abs- absorbed some of that, which was beneficial on um, the FTD. FTEs helped reduce the, uh, the overtime expense. Great. All right, I'm good. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you. Um, sure. Richie, do you want to have a final comment? I just, you know, I, I know I spoke earlier. I just, uh, you know what I forgot to mention is I wanted to thank the men and women on the Boston Fire Department, yeah, the Fire Prevention Headquarters, the men and women in the field, uh, they're out there every day. And, and, I, and I, I know I can speak on Bobby's behalf, too, that we're very proud to uh, have the best fire department in the, uh, in the world, and mm-hmm. we're proud to represent them. So right. I just and want to give a kudos to them. They did a great job. Thanks, Thank Richie. You. And the king of chiefs, as Timmy <laughs> McCarthy yeah, you know, calls him. Um, cool. uh, let, me, let me join you in that. Uh, I, I think our entire public safety unit, from EMS to Boston Police Department to, to you, the men and women on the fire department. We are very, very fortunate to have uh, some of the most talented, dedicated, committed people in the world. <laughs> and, and we work, all three agencies work very well together. Absolutely. And that's, uh, that's why I think, um, you know, our city's a model for many other cities our size and probably bigger as well. So uh, with that, no thank final you. comments. I'd like to thank um, Chief your entire team, all the men and women, BFD, this hearing stands adjourned.